Hello and welcome to Bar Snacks. This video is going to be a little different from my normal style because I'm going to be visually tackling some economic theory that I think is quite interesting. Today, we're going to be talking about how various elasticity measures, that's PED, PES, XED and YED, and how knowledge of them can be beneficial towards firms. We're going to start with PED. And one prerequisite for how we use PED, and it is that in our economic theory, we must assume firms are profit maximizers. Obviously, in the real world, NGOs exist, sustainable ventures exist, which may have other goals such as um, maybe equality, justice, or environmental goals or something like that. But here we simply assume that firms are profit maximizers. This means they want to make as much in revenue as possible. So how can they use elasticity to do this? Well, basically, if we take this example curve here, we can see that for various intervals here, every interval has the same numerical change. So here it's £10, here it's also £10, and but here it's 10 quantity and here it's also 10 quantity. To an untrained eye, it might look like elasticity is the same along this whole line because all things are kept in proportion here. But actually, that's not the case. And we can do a little evaluation just to illustrate that. So between this mark here and this mark here on our curve, you can see that if we're moving up this direction, there is a 25% increase in price from £40 to £50. Obviously, the um, equation for price elasticity of demand is percent QD over percent P. So this here is a 25% increase in price. Down here, we can see that it goes from 20 to 10 in quantity, and that's a drop off of a half, so it's gonna be minus 50, which equals negative two as our value for PED. That's up here in this section. Down here on this section, the, between these two marks, as we shift up the curve like this, we can see that here, there's a 20% drop-off in quantity, but a 100% increase in price. Now what that means is that if we plug that into this, into this equation over here, that actually our value for elasticity is different. And this is to do with the natural law of how economics works in that if things are more expensive and there's more proportion of income spent on a good, then that's going to be more elastic uh, when prices of it change. But what this tells us here is that for some, some regions down here, our value of POD, PED is actually inelastic, and for some up here, it's actually elastic. And the point at which it changes between the two is the midpoint, right here. And essentially, what firms that are profit maximizers need to do is maximize their total revenue, and they can use this to do so. If we have a curve under here, here's a second graph, and I've quite deliberately lined up the midpoints here. This shows total revenue for a demand curve such as this. Now, total revenue is obviously price times quantity, but you can see that it's actually the most at the midpoint. So what firms should aim to do is get as close to the midpoint as possible. So how can they do this, knowing this? Well, you can calculate that if you're in the inelastic section here, because demand is lower than price change, that means that if you increase the price, evidently your total revenue will increase. So if you're down here somewhere, you can afford to increase the prices Of your good and subsequently with our model probably go from around here at 50 quantity to up here at 40 quantity and you can see that there's a marked shift right here an upward shift along the revenue curve okay similarly if you're up here on the other side you can decrease your prices to achieve the same effect. Because the absolute value of PED is larger than one, 
That means that the good is elastic and more responsive to demand. So what you can do is if we shift down here back to our total revenue curve, see something like this at 10 quantity and a shift like this at 20 quantity. We can see a similar shift up the revenue curve. So this is how PED can be used by firms to maximize profit. Now let's move on to PES. Right, so now price elasticity of supply. PES really is the weird one out of the four main types of elasticity because it's not determined by the market mechanism. Rather, PES is determined by the firms themselves. There's a few different factors that determine PES. Firstly, we have, you can remember it with the acronym SCAMS, spare capacity. So for example, um, extra tables at a restaurant, so spare capacity, so if there are, if there's an increase in demand, if more people want to come and eat at that restaurant, they have the capacity to allow that to happen. Then secondly, uh, alternatives. So, for example, a printing press business can switch between printing magazines or greetings cards depending on demand. So that's alternatives. Then methods, and that's, so that's time and production. So, for example, an agriculture business would be rather inelastic because when you're growing crops, it takes a very long time from the planting of the crops to the actual harvesting of the crops and the sale of the crops. So your current business is based on decisions that you made quite a while ago, and so it's more inelastic in that way and you're less able to respond to demand. Finally, we have stocks. So that's that's stores of finished products or raw materials that can be used, that can be either sold or used for further production. Now, companies, which we've already stated are profit maximizers, want to be as responsive as possible to changes in demand. This so, if there's a sudden increase in demand, they can get as much product as is optimal out there as quick as possible to meet that extra demand and make that extra revenue. So it's good to be elastic. Right? So let's see how they would go about doing this. First thing is, stocks, is to have plenty in supply. If you have a lot of stocks, it's much easier to just push those out onto the market when, when required than having to so much more. Secondly, while methods may be hard to change, alternatives, it's good to have very mobile factors of production. Essentially what this means is that your FOP is a mobile. So for example, like the printing press, their factors are mobile, therefore their capital can be switched from producing greetings cards to producing magazines and back again. Therefore making it more elastic, therefore more efficient and a better system for maximizing revenue. Another way is let's say I had a, let's say I was making uh, chips. So if I had a machine that was to cut the chips and I could either choose between thin chips or big thick chips, then all I had to do was change around the thickness setting on my machine and then I could switch production from one to the other. So that's a very mobile FOP. Now spare capacity. We know from the law of diminishing marginal returns that just increasing one factor of production incrementally while leaving the others fixed leads to increasing marginal costs. So for this one, it's best to have land labor and capital all in spare capacity so we can just expand proportionally with all our factors of production and not lose efficiency along the way while increasing production right now we'll move on to cross price elasticity okay so this is cross price elasticity which is calculated by percent change in demand for good a over percent change in price of the good B. It measures the elasticity of demand for one good against a price change in another good. So we're going to start over here with substitutes. So let's say that a rival firm of mine raises its price. Let's say they produce beer. 
they raise their price up like this. Now, I also produce beer, but because their beer is more expensive now, more people are going to buy my beer, so my demand is also going to shift outwards. So far, all looks good for me. But let's say the other situation happened. Instead, we started out at this equilibrium here, and they dropped their prices from P2 to P1, like this. Now, my demand, therefore, is going to shift. My demand is going to shift back to Q1, like this. And if they keep this lower price than my beer, I'm going to consistently get a lower quantity demanded. This leaves us with a few business decisions as what we could do. We could either push our prices even lower, to compete with their beer, or we could attempt to make our beer seem like a more premium product. And leave it how it is, and hope that people will pay more for the premium. So this allows us to effectively model how rivals' pricing decisions affects our own demand. This is also important in the case of the complements over here. In a complement, complement goods are such like hot dogs and hot dog buns. In that, if people are going to demand one thing, there's going to be likely linked demand to the other. So if the price of hot dog buns falls, then more people will be buying hot dog buns, therefore more people will be buying hot dogs from my firm. So my demand is going to shift up. Let's try and apply this to a real life scenario. So let's say this firm's producing strawberries and our firm is producing cream, a complement to strawberries. If there's a good harvest of strawberries and the price of strawberries is low, then there'll be an extension in demand for strawberries because they'll be so much cheaper. In that way, we can also model that our demand is going to increase using pr cross price elasticity. So if we know that there's going to be a good harvest of strawberries coming up, what we can do is that we can make preparations to produce more in the future. That's going back to PES and changing our methods and looking at how we can be more elastic in response to a change in demand in the market. But we can effectively model what kind of an effect this will have on our business using XED. Now let's move on to the final type, which is YED. Okay, now this is our last elasticity measure. This is YED, which is income elasticity of demand. And the basic principle of YED has to do something with the economic cycle, which I've drawn over here on this diagram. So here's, it's a GDP time diagram. And essentially, this line represents the average GDP growth rate. But what re really happens is that this is just a best fit line for how the economy works in cycles. So here we have a boom going up when we're above the normal growth rate. And then we have a downturn down here. Now in a boon, what happens is that incomes rise here. Incomes rise. The average wage of any worker will rise in this section. And similarly, incomes will fall. Will fall there. So YD is completely concerned about how the rising and falling of incomes will affect demand. So over here, I've drawn a graph for an inferior good. Inferior good. And in, in a boom, inferior goods demand will fall because as people get more money, they will want to pay more for more premium brands. So what will happen is that Incomes rise from I1 to I2, and hence quantity falls from Q1 to Q2. Now, if we look down here, this is the opposite shape, and this is a normal or luxury good, where, it, where demand for it will rise during a boom. So... As income rises, 
so does the demand. This is a normal or a luxury good. But how does this apply to a firm? Let's say I was head of economic analysis at Tesco. Now Tesco, a big UK supermarket, they sell all times, types of good. They sell inferior goods, such as their own brand products, and they also sell normal or luxury goods, which are more expensive, um, branded, and generally considered a better quality product. So if I had some idea of what kind of economic situation that our country was in and how incomes had been affected recently, then I could start to make some good decisions. So let's say that we're currently in an economic downturn over here. Well, in an economic downturn, what's actually going to happen is that incomes are going to drop like this, and so demand for inferior goods is going to rise. Whereas when incomes drop on the luxury or normal side, demand will fall. So let's say I'm making a, a supply choice between own brand bread and Warburton's, which is a more premium branded good. So if I knew that we were in a downturn, I know that more people would start to demand the inferior, cheaper good as there'd be less money going around to spend on bread. Similarly, the demand would fall here because there'd be less money to spend on bread. So what I could do is then increase this in a downturn I could then increase the supply of my own brand bread to cater to larger demand and decrease the supply of the Warburton's bread to cater to a fall in demand there. Now, in an economic boom, in a boom period, I could just simply do the opposite to better cater to demand. And now, and then this elasticity would help increase total revenues for Tesco. Increases total revenues. And this brings us all the way full circle to right at the beginning of the video where I said firms are profit maximizers. That is what everything we do here is all about. And that's how we can use YED to improve our profits. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I've been Bar Snacks and I'll see you in the next one.